It's on like the, oh, there we go. Um, I'd like to call the meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee uh, to order. It's Friday, March 8th, and um, 2024, and we do have a quorum. Uh, we have several members who are joining uh, remotely today, and um, so that they are present. Uh, Senator Ablers, um, Senator Kupek, Senator Morrison are online, um, and so they, they are present at the hearing. Um, just a note for members, uh, when we take votes, um, I do need you to turn on your, your video. That's part of our remote uh, voting process. So if you can please um, kind of be making note of um, t at times that we need to take votes so that you can turn your video, your camera on and, and unmute uh, yourself. And then um, just a particular note that most of the bills that we have today do have author's amendments. So I will um, ask you to, um, as we begin bills, if we can have you be ready to, to um, turn your cameras on and, and uh, vote with us or vote um, orally, that would be really helpful so we can kind of keep moving along. Uh, today we have, um, five bills that are on the agenda that relate to the child welfare system in Minnesota. Um, and we have grouped them together. Um, Senator Mitchell has been doing a lot of work over the um, interim um, as co-chair of the Child Protection Task Force. And we have been aware of you know, significant um, kind of tragic issues that we're hearing about um, that relate to children who are um, experiencing, you know, deaths of children or poor outcomes for children. And we um, have had a focus over the past few months of, you know, what can we do to try and address these concerns? So um, Senator Mitchell has been working to kind of gather together some ideas that we can bring forward this session without it being uh, a session that we can do large uh, budget impact items. Um, and these bills today are things that she would like to present to the committee. Um, so, um, Senator Mitchell, if you'd like to begin, if you have some um, general comments, and then we'll first bill we'll take up is Senate File 3614. Thank you, Chair Wickland, and I, I think you summed up what we're doing uh, very well. We've been um, working as a group to try and um, make the child care system in Minnesota stay focused on the best interests of our children in the state, make sure that they have um, safe and equitable access to everything. Um, so because the task force got going again late last year, um, the pieces are kind of some smaller pieces with the thought that we will work on some of the bigger chunks once we get past this session. All of the things that I'm carrying forward today uh, do have amendments to get them into order because we are continuing to do work and, and talk with some of our different stakeholders. And just for transparency, there is some talk with the House that once the individual bills make it through their wickets, we might put them all together and uh, do a DE. And so you might be seeing me here again with some of these same pieces um, uh, to most efficiently figure out how we're going to present that to the floor. Um, with that said, uh, if I may start with Senate File 4204. Oh, that's fine. Or, oh, I'm sorry. Which one would you like me oh, to start with? I was thinking 3614, okay. but if you... I, it honestly does not matter to me, Madam Chair. I have them okay. all. All right. We'll begin with um, Senate File 3614. Um, Senator Mitchell has the A3 author's amendment. Is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair. Members, I'd like to adopt the author's amendment. Um, Senator Bolden moves the A3 author's amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The, the amendment is adopted. Senator Mitchell. 
Thank you. So um, I know you hear a lot of things. This is actually a portion of something that passed through this committee last year that um, did not make it through the House side of it. And um, that was the larger bill that when a child comes into the system, um, there are some children that have benefits attached to them, either survivor benefits, uh, if, if a parent had passed away, or disability benefits. And so the proposal that we had brought forth last year um, that we got some really strong positive feedback on would be to first notify any child when the, this was being asked for on their behalf and used on their behalf, um, and then to uh, possibly set it aside in, a, in an account for when they were an adult. Um, this year we are, because it did not make it through conference committee, we are re-attacking just the parts that I really feel get us into uh, both legal compliance and kind of ethical compliance, which would be making sure that children are notified if this is requested on their behalf. Um, so this does not still have the part that it, there would be an account and they would access the money once they were adult. But there have been cases in other states that have kind of, uh, that have found that really that notification needs to be going on because let's say there's kin and, and having that access to the, the SSI benefits would make a difference in them being able to financially support the child or just a child that's about to age out. We have, have children in the system that never knew that this money was being taken on, on their behalf. So just in terms of an equity start, uh, point of view, this will um, allow for the children, we pick the age of 13, um, you know, notifying a four-year-old that they have benefits might not be worthwhile, but so we, we set that age as when they would be notified and then making sure that um, kind of their next of kin, so to speak, would also be notified so that people are just aware of these benefits at the very least. With that said, I do have a couple testifiers on this, if we could um, call them forward. Thank you. Um, I have Ada Smith and Nikki Beasley, if you can come forward. And if, um, if that's the order you'd like to go in, if Ms. Smith, if you could state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hello, my name is Ada Smith. Thank you, and please proceed. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me the chance to speak before you again. My name is Ada Smith. I'm currently, I currently serve as a community board member at Foster Advocates, and I am a Circle of Support Youth Outreach Coordinator at Connections to Independence. I am a mother, a foster, a college student. I currently live in Hennepin County. I am a survivor of the failed policies and harmful practice, practices of our state well, child welfare system. I testified before you on this issue last session. I am here today to share more about my story and why we should be doing so much more. I was 13 years old when my mom passed away. I entered foster care at the age of 15. I was aware of the benefits even at the time, and still, 10 years later, as a state, we continue to steal these benefits from children. Still, there is no accountability, and last year was a missed opportunity to do the right thing. It is difficult to speak about this because I am pissed that we continue to ignore the harms caused to children in general. I miss my mom. I can no longer call her. I can't lean on her. My mom did, however, leave these funds, and the county cannot speak to how these funds were used or where they are. They can't even pr prove that they were used for me. At 25, I have many dreams for my future. I am in the process of trying to buy a home right now. I am working to build my business and finish school. While these are exciting moments, there are also ongoing moments of grief for me. The lack of support as a foster and not having the financial support doesn't end at 18. It follows you through school, motherhood, and the home buying life. While this may be just a chunk of change and money for some, symbolically, this was the last gift from my mom and one that I never received. I cannot change the harm or the instability that is a part of my life due to this current practice, but others do not have to struggle the way I did. 
it's never too late to do the right thing. This should not be the end, but this can definitely be the start. Please support SF3614. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, uh, Ms. Beasley. Thank you, Chair Wickland. It's okay. Good morning. My name is Nikki Beasley. I'm the Executive Director of Foster Advocates, an organization directed by and for fosters working to improve the foster care space in Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Fosters face unique challenges and uncertainties throughout their lives. Often we have experienced trauma and overall instability as a result of entering the child welfare system. Because of this, it becomes crucial to address foster rights, especially when they are eligible for federal benefits, such as survivor benefits, after losing a parent, or disability and social security. The loss of a parent or parents can be devastating for any child. While we cannot take away the pain and trauma of losing parents, as well as the trauma of being placed in foster care, we do have an opportunity, and dare I say an obligation, to at least inform fosters that their parents thought of them and planned for them in the event of their passing. Isn't that what those of us who are parents would want for our own children? Ensuring that fosters are informed about their parents' social security benefits should not only be a legal requirement, it is a compassionate and necessary step. Let us recognize the power we have to advance this bill forward and advocate for fosters' well-being now and in the future. Our foster community would like to see our state do more. This bill in front of us today is a step in the right direction, and we ask you to support Senate File 3614. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Um, I have another testifier, Ann Broskov. Um, and just wanted to also say, Ms. Smith, thank you for coming back to the committee to tell, yeah. tell more your story again. I really appreciate that. Ms. Broskov, um, please state your name for the record and begin. Good morning, Chair Wicklin and the members of the committee. My name is Ann Broskov, and I am the Director of Human Services for Brown County. Um, I also come here today with 25 years of experience in the field of child welfare, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators in regards to Senate File 3614, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak here today. First and foremost, I want to assure the chair and the committee of our support for providing notices to all the parties outlined in this proposal as to their social security benefits. I wish to provide four additional points of feedback for the committee's consideration. First, <clears throat> the existing technology systems counties rely upon, known as SSIS, would not fully support counties to consistently and reliably provide this notice. There is no identified field in SSIS that indicate that a child is eligible or receiving these social security benefits. Furthermore, there's no automation that would let us know when a youth turns 13 on a case manager's growing caseload. Without such automation, we truly fear that this very important notice may be inadvertently missed or delayed. Second, Due to the shortcomings of SSIS, as I outlined, the annual reporting requirements sought in this proposal must be manually tabulated by each individual county. Therefore, counties will need to individually craft, collect, and track the data. It is also noted that the modernization improvements are a priority for MAXA, as well as the Association of Minnesota Counties. Third, 
counties will look to partner with DHS to collaborate to create an appropriate template in SSIS that fulfills all the requirements of this proposal in a way that is accessible and understandable for all recipients. We are also mindful that this additional notice compromises our efforts in regards to the Child Protection Paperwork Reduction Act. Finally, counties would, would welcome access to on-demand training to educate themselves about the complexities of Social Security benefits and how to best support youth and their caregivers. While some workers may encounter youth on these benefits nearly every day of their work, others may only encounter this one time a year and would need reliable, up-to-date information and guidance. I thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today, and I welcome any further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, members, do you have questions for Senator Mitchell or the testifiers? I'm kind of watching the Zoom as well for, for any hands. I guess I'll just um, ask, you know, Ms. Broskoff, um, I understand, I mean, I can, I can really understand that, that we are in a, you know, difficult situation having a system that is not, you know, very malleable. <laughs> um, and we've begun to, you know, do the work to address that. Um, I mean, I think last session we did, we took some steps to, you know, make sure that we could allocate funding for systems modernization. Um, and it sounds like a great deal of work is needed, you know, to make that transition to a more modern system. Um, but I also feel like, you know, there's needs to be some, um, I need to understand better if there's some way that we can um, make progress on this type of request, you know, to, to get a notification. Because it just seems like uh, we, we can't keep putting, putting it off, um, you know, the, the kids in the system really um, count on us to try and do the best we can. So I don't know if you have any comments or, I mean, I understand your four, um, the four points you raise, you know, what barriers that kind of raises, but um, I just hope that we can keep working to see if this, if there is a viable way to, to do this kind of work this session. I don't know if you have any feedback on that or not. It's not really a question, I guess, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just reiterate that we, we just we certainly agree that this notice needs to provide to youth and and all the parties outlined and hopefully we can all come together to make the system improvements so that we can reliably and consistently do so. Senator Mitchell. Uh, yes, if I may. So um, you know this is something I have had some lengthy conversations with DHS about because. Um, the system is old, and I feel like we keep putting Band-Aids on it, but there hasn't been a full proposal for a new system, and so I've been very clear, like, if that is something we need to work on, then we need to work on it and, and get a new system funded and budgeted. Last year would have been ideal with, you know, the surplus money, but... Um, I feel like there's a little bit of a, uh, there's a frustration on my part when everything is, well, we can't because of the computer system, while also I've never had a proposal to get a new computer system. So at a certain point, we either need to give us a proposal and we'll work on fixing it, or we can't continue to use the computer system as an excuse for everything. Um, sorry to say that bluntly. Um, in this particular case, there's also, you know, social workers involved and guardian ad litems involved with these, these um, children. I know when I'm a foster parent, they're in my house every month. They, they know when a child is, is turning 13. Um, you know, it, it's not like no one's ever seen them that they would not notice that they were aging. And, and so I, I think there's some other ways we can figure this out. If we're figuring out ways to ask for and accept that money from the children, um, I think it is very fair that we are, because part of this is us also asking for an, an accounting, because when I've asked the question, of, are we making sure the money that goes to one child is being used for that one child and not just in a general fund, 
I haven't been always getting a straight answer that there's accounting and we are required to use the money allocated to a child for that child and not for other things. And part of this bill is the accounting. Um, we also, when we had the proposal last year that we would save the money for the children and give it to them after they aged out, um, no one could tell us how much money that was and how much money the state would potentially need to help supplement. So there's just such a lack of data. Um, I, I just don't think, I, I carried the Paperwork Ad Reduction Act. I am not trying to add paperwork to anybody, but I also think we need to, to do the, the basic things to comply with the law and make sure that uh, children are not feeling like they're being taken advantage of. Thank you. Any other member comments or questions? Um, I do think the amendment, you know, the, the statement you've added to the, in the direction that we provided last session, I think that's a good idea to make sure that that, that is something that's added to the um, reporting that's being done. And, and I look forward to, you know, the fact that, that there is a report that is coming out this summer. But um, I do hope that there is continued discussion over the limited time we have this session to, to see if there is a way that we can make meaningful progress, you know, and, and try and um, make sure that this doesn't doesn't stall for another year. Or so, thank um, you. Thank you very much for bringing this forward. If there's no other questions or comments, um, Senate File 3614 will be laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now um, we go to, is it a, a Senate File 3615? Apologies, I'm digging through my stack. Hmm. Senate File 3615 is a requirement addition for an out-of-home placement plan summary. And members, there's a author's amendment, the A1 amendment. If members could um, turn on their video and we can take action. Uh, Senator Bolden moves the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this uh, bill is to add a basically a plain language summary at the, the front of child placement plans. Um, I will say again, as having been a foster parent and has having gotten some of these plans, uh, they can be very thick with a lot of information uh, to the point that even me trying to find a partic particular um, thing that you need to work with or follow, um, it can be cumbersome, and and that is for someone who is used to reading legal documents and you know can navigate some of those, um, which not every person, every parent, every guardian is as as comfortable doing. So, and we want to make sure that families have the best outcomes. That if there is a plan for them, that they clearly understand it. And so, this summary was something that, out of the 2022 OLA report, was a recommendation um, to make it just easier for families, guardians, whoever is having to work these plans, have that framework to so that they really understand like the very basics of this. Um, again, the. I know there's a concern with the Paperwork Reduction Act that this is actually adding something. The amendment that um, you all just kindly passed um, was recommendations from DHS um, to use basically a, a form that was developed. So that will help make this an easier process to add that in. And again, if there is um, ever a new computer system, Hopefully, it would be one of those things where as, as the person is building the plan, they could just toggle elements that would go into a summary. We're not there yet, but again, we're thinking of these things. But in the meantime, I do really support this because if our goal is to reunify, if, if 
that is appropriate. We need to make sure that we are not having barriers to the families understanding the information that they are getting. So thank you for your consideration. I, I believe there is a testifier on this one as well. Uh, yes, I, I have on, on the list Nikki Conway. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Great. Good morning, Chair Wickland and committee members. My name is Nikki Conway, and I am the Child Welfare Manager in Scott County. Uh, I've spent the last 16 years uh, working in child welfare in both Ramsey and Scott counties, and I am here representing MAXA, the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators. Uh, first, thank you for your work and attention to improving the system for all Minnesota children and families. Uh, MAXA supports the premise of this bill and the need for parents to have the best information possible to do what they need to do to facilitate reunification of their children. That is an absolutely critical need for children and families. We agreed that a simplified out-of-home placement process is necessary for parents and for all parties. So to not repeat further our previous testimony, really our, our issue with this um, with this bill is, or concerns about it, are some of the same reasons that were already stated in previous testimony. We have an outdated technology system. Um, without improvements as it stands right now, this additional form would require potentially two to three hours of extra work for a child protection worker to do on a case that's a placement case. Um, on average 60, or excuse me, on average 50 to 60% of a worker's time is currently directed to SSIS documentation, especially in out-of-home placement cases. So let me repeat that, 50 to 60% of the time. Um, we know that research supports that relationship with families and relationship with parents is one of the best predictors of positive outcomes in child protection cases. And simply this extra added paperwork and time takes away from our ability to really build that relationship um, and do what we are set out to do, which is improve those outcomes for children and families. So we would support um, a more automated system that could provide this simplicity without manual entry for workers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments about um, Senate File 3615? Yes, I will just um, add, I mean, similar to the last um, bill, um, it does seem like we, we have urgent needs to address the, the most parents, you know, if they are in a position of being given a plan to, re, you know, for their family's reunification, that that they have a strong desire to, to be able to follow it. But if it's so complex and long, mm -hmm. the document is so long, that that is that seems to me like a huge barrier to that. Between that and being able to access if there's services that they need to access, along with mm -hmm. their um, participation in the plan, um, it just is it seems critical that we. Um, address their need to have something that's clear and, and understandable. Um, I hope that you can continue to work on this, Senator Mitchell. Mitchell. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and, and hopefully that there is um, some way we can come up with an idea that that is. I, I think the time spent by the workers on paperwork is, that's terrible. Um, you know, we need to um, address that. But I think um, if we want to be um, addressing um, improving the outcomes for children. Um, this, this seems like a critical step. So, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Mitchell, for your work on this. I just have a question, and maybe you spoke to this and I missed it. I see it talks about using plain language, which mm -hmm. I appreciate. Um, I'm wondering about parents who's, uh, for whom English is not their first language. Is this, uh, was there any discussion, or is this offered in uh, language, other languages that would, would potentially be more understandable for some parents. Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I believe we already have translation services, so a summary would also fall under the translation services as well. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Anything else, Senator Bolin? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, Senator Mitchell, any other comments about the bill? 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for taking this. Uh, again, I carried the Paperwork Reduction Act. I am not unsympathetic to this. Um, but just the fact that, again, as someone who has written, you know, legal works before, um, e even testimony that writing a one-page summary would take a couple hours, I think speaks in part more to the issue of the computer system if it's taking that long um, than the fact that a, a summary should take that long to write. So I, I know that the computer system is absolutely something that we need to work on, but I just don't feel like it can be a barrier to uh, families being able to understand what they need to be doing. Thank you. Um, I understand that maybe um, Jennifer Sommerfeld has a, um, something she'd like to add to this bill, the conversation. So if you could come forward. Uh, good morning. Uh, please state your name for the record and, and again. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, we provided Senator Mitchell with some technical assistance, mm -hmm. which was adopted today as the A1 amendment. Um, and it, we did that because we let her know that we already have a template in SSIS. We did have some follow-up conversations with counties on that template and realized that it probably would result in longer than two pages to complete it. So the amendment, the amendment adopted says the form developed. I mean, that's fine, but we're thinking we should just say a form because we actually do need to go back and revise it. Just a technical suggestion. <clears throat> Madam um, Chair, Mitchell. If, if that is a suggestion that will make things easier. Again, we, we have been working with everyone to try and make this as um, uncumbersome as possible. I'm not sure if that's a word. But, um, you know, so a form is being provided in the system. Hopefully that, that minimizes the time. If we're going to redo the form and it is as easy as a technical change is making the word a, um, if our uh, council would be able to offer that as a <laughs> verbal amendment. I'm not on the committee, so I'm not sure I can offer that, uh, but um, someone could. Ms. hoffman you would there be an oral amendment that you could suggest? No, exactly. Yes, if I could take one moment to count how many ahs and thes there are in the sentence since we did adopt the amendment. Yeah. I do need, we, it's incorporated into the language, so I just need one quick. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hoffman, you? Uh, Madam Chair, members, the oral amendment would be page six, line 17, delete the second the and insert a. Thank you. Members, uh, on that oral amendment uh, to be made to Senate File 3615, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the oral amendment is adopted. Thank you. Um, Thank you again, Senator Mitchell. Um, I don't know if you had any other comments. No other comments. Um, this bill, um, Senate File 3615, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next in our packet mm -hmm. is Senate File 3820. <clears throat> and this is a bill. Um, this is a bill that Senator Hoffman is author, but you're co-author and presenting for him today. So. <clears throat> and I do, th I think there's, oh yeah. There is. There is an A1 amendment, A1 author's <clears throat> amendment for Senate File 3820. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Mitchell. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> this, again, is also something that we heard in the Child Protection Task Force. And um, basically, child protection in Minnesota is predominantly run by the counties with um, DHS or what will... Um, soon be um, the Department of 
children, youth, and families. I'm not sure if I put those in the right order. Um, <clears throat> kind of as an overseer. Because of that, there is some inconsistency where if someone needs to report child abuse, they report it to their county. Um, <clears throat> in theory, every county should have someone available 24 hours for those reports. They should have translation services. Um, the number should be easy to find. People, it shouldn't be hard for people to figure out how to make a report. But because we have so many different counties that have this put together in so many different ways, one of the things that we would like to look at um, and we have gotten feedback that there are times people want to make a child abuse report, that it is hard for them to figure out how to do that. So this is basically to create a study to look at the feasibility of doing that as um, either making it one centralized reporting for Minnesota, and then the information would go back down to the counties, or still having those, those county entry points but additionally having one site at Minnesota where people can report, and then there would always be a phone manned, and then there would always be the translation services and things of that nature. So just looking at that initial point of reporting and how we can make it better is the theory behind this. Um, with that said, I stand for any questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Mitchell. I don't show any testifiers, so members, do you have any questions about, about this proposal? It does seem like this is a, a need to have make sure that it's um, a reasonable and sensible process for, for people to report. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it does seem like a study would be helpful to, to find out more about how, how to do that. So uh, I don't see any questions or comments from members online. Um, so we will... Um, we will also be laying over Senate File 3820 uh, for possible inclusion in a future bill. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next is Senate File 4204. This is, relates to ombudsperson's access to social service information system authorization. Uh, Senator Mitchell has the... A1 amendment to Senate File 4204. Members, all those in favor of the A1 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Mitchell. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh, this would allow uh, limited, very specific to data needed to do their jobs, the OMSBUD persons uh, that relate to different things under the OMSBUD for foster youth to have access to that SIS, SSIS system that we have been talking about. Um, to do their jobs and to better advocate for the people that come to them, sometimes that data is needed and currently they would have to go to DHS every single time and request the data. So, uh, I mean, these are offices within, you know, our system. Um, they're advocating for the families. And when we had one of the Child Protection Task Force, this is one of the top things they asked in terms of being able to more efficiently do their jobs and serve their communities is, is to have this access without going through all the wickets. Um, I will just be transparent. There is some concern about the ability, even if we make this authorization, to actually do the access because of the computer system. Um, but hopefully it still gets them some pieces of access. And then if there is ever a better computer system, um, you know, then they will have a little bit more access. Uh, the other counterpoint that I will be transparent about is, you know, there there is private information in there. So the amendment was trying to even tighten that you know they can only be using the specific data that they need for their job. Again, these are employees of the state, so we would trust that they would use that appropriately. Um, and then with a new system, there would be more firewalls and tracking once they were, you know, once this would set up, would be set up once we ever get a new computer system. So that's where we are. With that said, um, 
I have testifiers from some of those agencies that came to us requesting the data. Thank you, and welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hello and good morning. Thank you, Chair and members. For the record, my name is Jill Kehalani Esh. I am the Ombudsperson for American Indian Families with the Office of Ombudspersons for American Indian Families. We are the only independent state agency of its kind in the nation. I speak today on behalf of our agency, as well as the Office of Ombudspersons for Foster Youth, the Office of Ombudspersons for Families, and the Ombuds for Family Child Care Providers. I prepared written testimony um, along with other ombuds offices, and I encourage you to read our testimonies on the importance of us having direct and immediate access. I don't want to repeat my written testimony here, but I want to highlight how you can help us so we can help our families. Everyone has 24 hours in a day. No matter what we do, we cannot save any of the 24 hours, but what we can do and what we have control over is how we use the time that we have. One thing I never want to do is waste anyone's time because time is so precious. Passing SF4204 will save all of us time. As ombuds, we wouldn't have to reach out to DHS or the county for what we could find in SSIS ourselves on the cases that we're working on. In my testimony, I provided two examples where if I had access to SSIS, it would have made my job easier. Previously, Previous to the Office of Ombuds Persons for American Indian Families being created by the legislature in 2021, and I would like to thank all of you who supported that, I was under the umbrella with the Office of Ombuds Persons for Families. I went back and looked at my data as to how many investigations that I had. In 2020, I had 64 investigations. If I had access to SSIS, a good majority of those cases maybe did not need to go the investigation route as to my contacting DHS and the county for information. So by passing SF4204, you will save us time. You will save the county and DHS time for not having to respond to our requests, and we can work more expeditiously. When the state begins to invest in a new SSIS system, which we all strongly support, have the ombuds at the table so we can have input on what we need. So please help us, the ombuds, ombudspersons, ombudsmen, so we can help our families in the most expeditious way. As I noted in my written testimony, I co-chair the United States Ombuds Association Children's and Families chapter. One of our United States Ombuds colleagues sent out a survey last year on how many Ombuds had direct access. 19 states have direct access. In addition, I have learned that there are community agencies who do some contracted work with DHS, and they have access to SSIS. So they have access, but the state Ombuds persons do not. Please support Senate File 4204 so we ombuds can have access to SSIS. I'd like to thank Senator Mitchell, who authored this bill, and to Senators Hoffman and Chapman, who've already signed on to support it. My ask is simple. On behalf of the Office of Ombuds Persons for Families, Office of Ombuds Persons for American Indian Families, Office of Ombuds Persons for Foster Youth, and Office of Ombuds Persons for Family Child and Care Providers, can we count on each of you to support it so that we can have access and we can work with our families as fast as, as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, members, do you have any questions about this proposal? And I just want to say thank you very much for the, for the testimony that you gave us in, on paper. And then um, I would suggest members take a look. There are several other um, letters that have their, indicated their reasoning for you know, requesting this, this access. So, but I appreciate your including specific examples. I was going to ask about how many other states, you know, if you, if you had that information. So thank you for letting us know that this is um, not all states, but there are a significant number that already have this kind of access in place. So 
Um, Senator Mitchell, any other comments about the bill? No, again, I just uh, thank you all for considering this. Um, you know, this is an, an, an example of how we were trying to let the agencies work more efficiently and, and hopefully save them a little time and, and then get them a framework to support the families the, be the best they can. Thank you. Uh, this bill does need to go to the Judiciary Committee. And so, um, members, um, would Senator Bolden, would you make the motion that Senate File uh, 3820 be as amended? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 4204. Um, Senate File 4204 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Uh, so, um, members, all those in favor, please uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Um, Senate file 4204 as amended is passed and referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you. And let's see, the last, I believe, for you is Senate file 4761. <coughs> There is, and I believe there is an A1 author's amendment. And members, um, Senator Bolden moves the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Mitchell. <clears throat> Thank you again. Um, so this is... Uh, what I consider our ability to continue this work going forward. As I said, this year we were trying to pick some things that we could easily get framework set up, but we do have some bigger issues that we need to address, and I really wanna do those things in a mindful manner, making sure we have <clears throat> all the groups brought to the table, um, from OMSBUD people to social workers to um, possibly even the pediatricians that deal with child abuse, um, because while a Senate task force or a task force, a bi um, House and Senate task force on child protection is wonderful and a lot of us have different unique backgrounds, we don't have all of the picture and we wanna make sure when we're working on these really, really important issues um, like Minnesota has a two track system for uh, if a report is made, one that's investigatory, which should be used for real abuse, and another one that is more of an assessment, especially if a family just needs services. Um, and we're not sure that that is working properly in Minnesota. So we wanna be able to bring first some of these bigger issues an advisory council together so that we can really kind of call in testifiers, um, have a group that's bringing all those perspectives. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a frog in my throat. Um, we have already put together the framework, but of course, once this came forward, we have had some more groups say, you know, we would really like a seat at this table. So I will be transparent that we are still working on this a little bit, even with the amendment that we offered today. This will still go to state and local government um, where I sit. So I am hoping that we will still consider moving this along, knowing that I will be doing some more work on it and there will probably be another amendment. But to date, we have put together a, a list of organizations that we think should be engaged in this space. And as I said, we are still talking to some other groups to make sure we really have the best council that we can put together. <clears throat> but this will be the group that once we get past this session is, is really trying to work on, for lack of a better term, the big rocks in Minnesota that, that we need to take a look at in a mindful way. So I am hoping that this can move forward today <clears throat> so that we can start um, doing that hard work once we get out of season with, with a, a good team in place. Thank you. And we have a testifier who is online, um, Lisa Hollenstein. Oh. Sorry, I um, had you listed, but that's great. You're, I'm here. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Better yet? Um, please Madam, state your name for the record and begin. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Lisa Hollensteiner. I practiced in emergency medicine and served on the governor's task force 
on the protection of children. I am currently the board chair for Safe Passage for Children, which is a nonprofit that advocates for child welfare, particularly in the child protection system. I'm also here to represent a coalition of 20 professionals, which formed after Senator Mitchell and Representative Pinto asked for suggestions about how to improve the child protection system in Minnesota. The members of this group have all interacted directly with children who have been abused and have personal understanding of the issues. I represent members who include child abuse pediatricians and their associates, mental health professionals, a previous child protection supervisor, juvenile court judges, and a county sheriff, amongst others. One of the issues the coalition has discussed and agreed upon is the need for an ongoing advisory council for child protection. Child protection is very complex, and while the task to address issues may seem overwhelming, the risk of ongoing child injuries and possible fatalities necessitate that we put forth our best efforts. Having served on the governor's task force, I can tell you that identifying areas for improvement and searching for solutions required time. We met frequently over several months, heard testimony from professionals, and had long discussions. I tell you this because we believe that concentrated and ongoing effort is required to delve into the complexities of the system and to make the best recommendations. Occasional and limited meetings will not suffice. Our coalition has met and discussed council membership and its objectives. We believe the group needs to include more members representing the interests of children and individuals working directly in the field, such as child abuse pediatricians, juvenile court judges, mental health professionals, child protection workers. We believe that the main goals of an advisory council should be to evaluate if Minnesota's two-track system prioritizes child safety and if the services needed to implement these child protection case plans are sufficient and available statewide. We have created a list of more specific objectives that can be shared in the future. We support this bill and look forward to working with Senator Mitchell and the proposed advisory council to make meaningful changes to our state's child protection system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, members, do you have any questions? Any members online have any questions about the advisory council? Um, I just was wondering, when I looked at the duties, um, it looks like you have, I guess you have some things that the council must address. I didn't see the um, inclusion of looking at our two-track system in there, but um, are you thinking that that would be under, like the, the council may collect additional topic areas? Um, I just one, Senator Mitchell. So uh, that is one of the discussions we're having. Um, not only, you know, I'm so grateful for different groups coming to the table and, and saying they want to participate. So as, as we're working on this, and as I said, I, you know, it's still going to one other place, so we'll get some of those things in. But, um, you know, making sure we're bringing the right people to the table, but not making such a large council that it's just unwieldy. So that is, that's one of the things we're looking at. And then the other thing is in relation to that, um, how specific we want to be about duties because as we bring all these people to the table, you know, there might be an issue that comes up that isn't even something that we're aware of and we don't want to kind of pin them in to not being able to focus on something that might end up being really important. So we're trying to figure out that balance um, as, as we continue to work on this of, of how specific we even want to be because we also want the advisory council to work on what they decide is most important. And, um, and of course, I'll be part of it. So something important like that, I would just make sure got brought up. Um, and that they have the ability to call the testifiers that they really think would be the most meaningful in, in the different issue areas. So it is a balance of making sure a couple things get tackled, but also allowing flexibility. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's that's good to hear. Um, I think that that was the other um, area I had just a question about just the size and making sure that it is something that we've kind of looked at. Uh, maybe other advisory councils, just how to make make sure it's an effective size and also representative. So, um, yeah, I think that it is a challenge because there are so many disciplines involved. I just I. I can definitely see where, you know, you, you have a lot of different 
expertise that would be beneficial to have on a council. And so I look forward to seeing how you how you work through that and Thank come you. up with a, a final solution. So <clears throat> members, any other questions? Um, so as um, Senator Mitchell mentioned, this needs to go to the state government committee. Um, so um, Senator Bolden would to make the motion that Senate file 4761 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on State Government. Yes, Madam Chair, that is my motion. Thank you. All, all those members in uh, favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Um, Senate file 4761 as amended um, is passed to the Committee on State Government. Thank you so much for Thank your you. time today, everyone. I, I know you have tackle a lot of really um, meaty topics, and so I appreciate your attention to this. Yeah, thank you for your work, and I look forward to more, you know, continued discussions about this is such an important topic for, for kids and families in our state. So I look forward to f future work with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, now we will move to uh, Senator Bolden. Senate file, let's see, 3,500. And Senate file 3,500, I don't see any amendments, so <laughs> please proceed and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is correct. No amendment. Uh, thank you, members, for hearing this bill this morning. Um, I am going to be very brief, and then we do have a testifier via, uh, via Zoom. So uh, this is a statute related to specialty dentistry, um, and we are just striking four lines um, that were inadvertently placed into this statute. They don't actually belong here. This is a technical change uh, that we are correcting. And uh, with that, I'll turn it to my testifier to say a little bit more about that. Yeah, yes, members. Uh, we have uh, Bridget Anderson from the Board of Dentistry on Zoom. If you can state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Bridget Anderson, Executive Director, Minnesota Board of Dentistry. And thank you for Senator Bolden for um, you know, bringing this bill forward for us, this Senate File 3500. It also does have a companion file in the House, uh, House File 3612. We do appreciate this uh, for your consideration. It actually inadvertently is in um, an incorrect part of statute. As you can see in the language here, it does refer to a full dental license. And so uh, inadvertently it's limiting a full dental license and that's not the intent of our specialty license um, in, within the statutes there in that section. So a specialty license is a completely separate process. This clause is uh, really referring to that full dental license for individuals that choose to practice in a specialty area. Um, so really that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the long and short of it. We really would like that removed out of here. It will also uh, remove a barrier to this section or to that license as well, that full license, because like I mentioned, it really should not be here. It does not apply here. And also a full dental license is just that. They have met all the criteria in the state for a full unencumbered license. So I'd be happy to answer questions, or if you if you need an example, I'm happy to provide that as well, Madam Chair and members. Thank you very much, uh, members. Any, Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> um, I don't see I don't see anybody online who has a question. Senator Bolden, any any other comments? It I, seems like a very uh, technical change and um, good to take care of. Yes, Madam Chair, I have nothing, nothing more to add. Uh, Senator Bolden um, would, let's see, this bill, actually, we will just lay over. So Senate file 3500 um, is laid over for possible inclusion in a future bill. And Senator Bolden also has Senate file 3809. Senator, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I am grateful to be before you with Senate File 3809, which proposes to allow out-of-home respite for children to be offered in an unlicensed setting. 
Respite is a vital service that supports families throughout the state. Access to safe and reliable respite options is crucial for families needing to take a break from their caregiving responsibilities. In 2020, a change was made to where out-of-home respite for children could be provided, limiting the service to only licensed settings. This change has resulted in the loss of trusted options for families and reduced the services availability. With me today is Sarah Grafstrom from ARM. ARM has been engaged in conversations with the department since this change was implemented and has worked to, together to develop language which would once again allow for out-of-home respite to be provided in an unlicensed setting. Those conversations with the department um, uh, have been ongoing. I would also like to turn the committee's attention to two letters that are in your packets from parents uh, sharing their story of losing respite, losing their respite option and uh, you know what that has meant to them and their families. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it over to my testifier to walk through some of the specifics. Great. Um, and I have Sarah Grafstrom, and uh, I think just wanted to mention this bill did originate in the Human Services Committee and was heard there, and so the the part of the bill that is most related to our committee or is related to the jurisdiction of this committee is section one. So um, please, uh, Ms. Grafstrom, if you can uh, state your name for the record and, and begin your testimony. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, for the record, my name is Sarah Grafstrom and I am the Senior Director of State and Federal Policy at ARM. Um, I will try to keep my comments specific to section one, but maybe just give a really brief overview of the changes that we're making and why we're making them. That's fine. Perfect. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out for members, yes. like I had just realized that this is one that, that has started in another committee. Yes. So, thank so you. Um, one of the services our members provide is respite, both for adults and children. Um, respite can be provided as a daily service when an individual is accessing the service for 10 hours or more, or a unit-based service, which would be used for anything under 10 hours. Um, it can be provided in an individual's family home, in a hotel, at a camp, or in a licensed setting. And for adults, it currently can be provided in an unlicensed setting. Um, respite can be provided by a family member or a person working under a provider's 245D license. Uh, the bottom line is respite is a unique critical service that providers tailor and develop to meet the unique needs of their community and people that are utilizing the service. Um, the bill in front of you today is specific for out-of-home respite for individuals under 18 when the person providing the service is not related to the person receiving the service. Um, so as Senator Bolden already said, in 2020, a change was implemented by the Department of Human Services that restricted where this particular type of respite could be provided. So prior to 2020, this service could be provided in a licensed 245D setting or in an unlicensed setting, as long as that provider had a 245D license and appropriate approval was received by the child's case manager. Uh, and just an example I often use is a trusted special education teacher. Maybe they're retired and they know um, families in their community they would open up their home and maybe provide respite in that home a couple weekends a month um, working through the provider in their community. Um, that can no longer happen unless that, um, that teacher gets their physical home licensed by the department. Um, so this change has drastically reduced the amount of available respite, uh, and the bill in front of you will allow for this service to once again be provided in that unlicensed setting. Um, with very specific requirements in place. So for this committee, the, um, the background study piece, this is the piece that we're continuing to work on with the department um, to refine and make sure that we're meeting all federal requirements and that um, the requirements that the state are looking at to make sure that everyone in the home has an active background study. Um, so again, this is the one piece that we're still in active conversation with the department on to again, make sure that everyone in the home has that study and that we are um, meeting all federal BCA requirements as well. Um, there's also um, safeguards in the bill that say the child's case manager uh, must conduct and document an assessment of the home, the child's guardian and legal representative have visited the home, and certain timelines that we have to meet as far as no more than 10 consecutive days um, in an unlicensed setting at any given time, and a cap of 46 days total in the calendar year that an individual could be receiving respite in an unlicensed setting. Um, so we know that respite is a critical upstream service that supports families, and without access to this reliable and safe respite options, families are turning to alternatives um, such as more congregate settings or even um, 
emergency rooms um, for their children. So we're grateful for the department's collaboration on this legislation, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions the committee has. Great, thank you. Um, we do also have a testifier online, John Nelson. If you can please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is John Nelson. I'm the Executive Director of Residential Services Incorporated. Um, we provide services in East Central and North um, Eastern Minnesota. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about Senate File 3809. RSI has provided respite services to families of adults and children with complex medical and behavioral needs for many years. Uh, this includes out-of-home respite. My wife and I also just personally have provided out-of-home respite to a family um, uh, of friends of ours who, whose daughter has very complex needs. So I've seen firsthand you know, the value of out-of-home respite and the impact it has on families, especially when they lose this service. The, um, you know, I really can't overstate the importance of this bill. Um, since 2021, when the licensing requirement um, for out-of-home respite was implemented, it passed in 20, but implemented in 21, Minnesota has seen a significant loss of respite options and experienced the unfortunate outcomes of this loss. The loss of out-of-home respite options for children has resulted in people not wanting the expense and the hassle of getting their home licensed as a foster care home. In many cases, this left providers with no no place to offer these services, leading to a significant decrease in the use of out-of-home respite for children and an increase in the costly consequences. You, you may think that, why don't people just get their home licensed? Again, there's a cost to it, about $500, and just the hassle and the changes that might have to be put into place in order to do this for family, friends, one or two weekends a month. So what's happened is out-of-home respite options, the loss of them means families are not getting a break from the 24-7 challenges of raising a child with complex medical and behavioral needs. The um, RSI has seen children that we once served with this service being placed in hospitals and referred to our child foster care homes for out-of-home placement. If you look into the children who are boarding in hospitals these past few years, I am confident you will learn the loss of out-of-home respite was part of the problem for many families. RSI has been told by the parents of children referred to our program about how the change to requiring um, out-of-home respite be done in a license and came unexpectedly. I wasn't aware of any kind of problem with um, it being done in an out-of-home setting um, or an unlicensed setting. The, um, the, the change has resulted in you know, a costly impact on the system in terms of trying to serve these children in other sites. When we used to provide out-of-home respite, it had to be done in, by a 245D provider, which RSI is, it had to be done in a setting that was approved by the family and the guardian and the county case manager. And we would be able to work with families, friends, relatives um, to develop these respite services, including even using our own employees at some times to contract for out of home respite. It, you should know that parents, case managers were actively involved with the planning and the training to develop the service. And it was a service that met a need and helped keep children in their own home. And this is what this bill would do is to continue that practice of working with families and case managers. So Senate file 3809 will help fix the self-inflicted problems created by the change to requiring a licensed setting for out of home respite. And I'd like to emphasize that the cost of children boarding in hospitals and being placed out of their homes will dwarf any potential costs that might come with this bill. So I urge you to support this bill. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Senator Bolden, any other comments? No, Madam Chair. Happy to answer any questions members have. Uh, members, do you have any questions for Senator Bolden or the testifiers? It seems like a well um, thought out. Oh, 
I Senator Kubek. Sure. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, not so much a question, uh, but just a comment on the bill. Um, thank you, Senator Bolden, for bringing this uh, forward. I hear from so many people about how important the respite care uh, is and the access to it uh, has been tough as of late. Um, certainly, there are workforce challenges, too. Uh, and this, I think, is, is a great step forward. So I just want to thank you for bringing this bill forward. Thank you. Any, any other members? have comments or questions? I guess I don't have any questions. I think it, it seems like a, like a, a well thought out um, way to try and address this, these concerns. Um, the bill does need to move to judiciary um, because of the background studies component. And so um, we will get that moving um, on its way today. So members, um, Senator Bolden, your motion would be that Senate file uh, 3809 uh, be recommended, or yeah, we didn't amend it, so uh, Senate file 3809 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Senate file 3809 is recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you. And now uh, we have just one more bill, and if Senator Bolden can chair for me, then I will move to the table. Whenever you are ready, Chair Wickland, we will um, move Senate File 4526. Thank you. Um, I do have an A1 amendment that will um, make the language, um, adjust the language so that there is not a, a cost um, to the bill. It just one of the dates that's um, currently in law to a, a date in the future. Um, so if we could move the A1 amendment. Very good. Uh, Senator Wicklin moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? The A1 amendment is adapted. Uh, Senator Wicklin, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill relates to the insulin safety net program that we established in Minnesota in um, 2020. Um, the bill relates only to the the long-term or the continuing need program aspect of the uh, program because we had, um, when the bill was passed, it incorporated a sunset for the, um, the long-term safety net uh, part of the program. And this bill will just remove that sunset. Um, it's been a successful program, and um, the continuing need program provides a pathway for Minnesota residents with documented high insulin costs to obtain affordable insulin on a continuing basis, subject to income-based eligibility requirements. Um, the insulin safety net program also includes an urgent need program, and that is, is an ongoing program, and that will continue. Um, there is still a need for this uh, program to continue. Uh, there have been changes in, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in access to insulin at lower costs, but uh, um, there are still many people who are having difficulties affording their insulin. And so this gives another route uh, for them to apply and be um, served by uh, a patient assistance program. Um, a study was done and came out last October and um, noted in the study is that pharmacists um, noted that the programs were especially helpful for uninsured and Medicare enrolled Minnesotans. Uninsured Minnesotans tend to face the highest list prices for their insulin, and so uh, through these uh, patient assistance programs, um, there is a way that they can um, access uh, a much more affordable um, insulin. 
Um, so I would like to see this the program continue. I think it, it has demonstrated value um, and is still needed. And so I think we should be removing the, uh, the sunset that we, we put in place in 2020. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Wickland. Members, any questions or discussion? Seeing none, I will just say, Madam Chair, thank you for bringing this bill. Um, insulin is life-saving medication, and as you said, there are still folks who um, experience very high costs. We have seen those costs go up um, uh, you know, over the last few years. Um, and so I think anything we can be doing to decrease the barriers for people to get the medicine that they need is important. So thank you for bringing this bill. Uh, anything uh, further you would like to add? No, thank you. I think that, uh, as I mentioned, I think there have been efforts um, at the federal level. The Biden administration has made some strides in uh, addressing insulin costs, but that's for a segment of the population um, that's on Medicare. But um, I think there still are, are many Minnesotans that face um, high prices, and the Insulin Safety Net Program is one way that we can provide um, them a way to access it in a, a more reasonable, affordable manner. So thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Wickland. With that, Senate File 4526 will be laid over for uh, possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill. Anything else? And with no further business before us, uh, this committee is adjourned. Oh.